you're heading back tomorrow, right? No, actually, I'm, I'm here all week. I'm here for Thanksgiving, yeah. I'm yeah, back I had a feeling we might run into each other, so uh, I just wrote down some things that have been I've been wondering about from Mortal Kombat. And uh, going back to, you're a comic book guy. You sure. know, I, I was watching a documentary about comics and how they're made. Uh, like, the DC method is to write the scripts first and then do the art. And the Marvel method is the opposite. They do the artwork first, then they later fill out the speech. Um, I think you did the entire comic book, both the art and the speech. So what's the John Tobias method for doing a comic book? You mean the MK1 comic? And MK2. Oh, yeah. Uh, those, um, I'm trying to think. Those, oh, you know what? I actually, I had the story in my head, and I would actually just do rough sketches of the pages and I, before I wrote anything just for those comics. Like, I kind of knew what the story was, and so I would kind of do the rough sketches, and then I did the writing after. Okay. And I think I can do that because I'm an artist as opposed to a writer, so I'm able to kind of visualize the story. Mm -hmm. Yep. A little bit easier for me. It's more the Marvel method. I don't, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't know that I would do that now. You know, I don't know. Is that how you did the real Ghostbusters and other things? That was did? different. That was, um, I worked with the writer, and so they gave me a written script, and I never just did the story. Okay, so you've had to go both ways, both ways but yeah. when you're in charge of the whole thing... Yeah, then if, yeah, if you're writing first. and drawing, I think especially yeah. if, you know, if you're an artist, you think visually. Right. So you tend to tell stories that way. Okay, cool. Uh, so speaking of comics, in the first Mortal Kombat comic, you've got K uh, Kano and Sonya have these high-tech ammunition belts, which um, I think actually oh, yeah. I've got sure. pictures up here. Sonya's got one yeah. and Kano's got right. one. Uh, so let me hold this up for the camera. But, you know, that's never explained in the story at all. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention to the story, you can kind of see that when Sonya gets captured, her ammo belt's gone. Oh, yeah. So what is this thing? How does it work? No Talk idea. No <laughs> idea. <laughs> Literally, I just drew it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, no, honestly, I just... So, but you know what was in my mind? But it's like high tech. It's yeah, it was. High -tech so you know what was in my mind was, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, what I was conscious of with the, with the early game was that there's not a lot of place to tell story in an arcade game. And so I thought that um, just kind of through character archetypes, that's how you can uh, embed story. And so with Sonya and um, Johnny Cage and Jax, those types of characters, I made them, I remember thinking we should make them a little bit more high tech just to kind of um, contrast against the uh, sort of the more the Eastern mysticism from of Liu Kang and Shang Tsung in that world. Yeah. So those guys are more magic. They're more that kind of thing. More and Sonya, Jax, and Kano, they come from the real kind of high-tech world. And so I, I always liked that um, mm -hmm. that kind of contrast between the characters. And it was almost like the, the, the um, what I wanted to do there was do like this clash of worlds. It's right. like this is the real sure. world, and they're delving into this world of mysticism and, and magic. And, and their real world is a little bit more high-tech than little bit. our world. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but maybe 20 years ahead of time. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff that you wrote about is starting to come to pass now. Like. Uh, people are actually getting cybernetic eyes. Oh, is that right? They, they, you know, it's helping blind people see. No, it's really doing good things. I'll tell you a story know. about how the cybernetic eye came out. Yeah. So originally, Kano was just going to have an eye patch. Right. And uh, Rich Divizio and I were at a costume shop um, looking, we were looking to get his um, his belt that he wore. Yeah, and we were looking at different costume pieces. And I had a, I was actually going to buy the eye patch. And then I saw it was like a, um, like a Mardi Gras mask. It was like a, a chrome Mardi Gras mask, and I saw it, and I remember holding it up to Rich's face, thinking, you know, um, it would look cool if I cut that out. And I was thinking of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator, you know, when he had the, the skin kind of peeled off his face. That's kind of where the idea came from. And so I brought the mask and just kind of cut around it and made that the eye patch. Cool. That's how that happened. So it's just kind of by the seat of our pants. Yeah. As opposed to some grand scheme. Yeah, no, but it worked really well. Yeah, it worked out so I know that with MK Special Forces, uh, you never had the chance to tell the whole origin of things like this for some of these characters. If you had, if we had seen the final version of MK Special Forces that you had originally uh, had worked out, how did Kano lose his eye? Oh wow! You know, I don't remember much about that game. I don't know. Um, what the fuck is this? Maybe we did we tell that story in the in the game? 
he just had his metal eye right from the beginning. We never see what happened. Or, or in your version of Mortal Kombat, like in your vision, how, what, what's the reason that Kano needs the metal eye? Well, the story, I think, was that one of Sonya's buddies shot him in the eye. Okay. And so, and then he ends up killing her buddy, and then she's going to get revenge for okay. her killing his buddy. That was the backstory, that, I believe. Okay, yeah, that's cool. But, yeah, I don't, I don't remember in Special Forces whether we were going to tell that or not or what. Okay. Um, going back to East meets West. In the West, you've got, I'm sorry, in the East, you've got Shang Tsung. Mm -hmm. Now, the games have been a little bit uh, fuzzy. <laughs> the games have been a little bit fuzzy. Is Shang Tsung originally from Earthrealm and he fought for Outworld? Or is he actually an Outworld goon uh, who's come to take over Earthrealm with Chao Kahn? Uh, I think my original intention with Shang Tsung was that he was from Earth. Okay. And that he had kind of like sold his soul to this god from another realm. And so he's a traitor for us. Right. And so in exchange for doing that, you know, he's that's where he, uh, you know, the idea of him becoming really old and having to eat the souls of other people to kind of stay young. But the idea was that he was from Earth and that he like kind of sold his soul, you know, to these other world gods. Okay. Um, you know, uh, to get the power that he had. Right. He needs to stay alive, and that's how he does it is by consuming the souls. And Quan Chi is another sorcerer. Um, in your vision, is he originally from the Nether Realm, or did he come from somewhere else to aid Shinnok? You know, I, I don't remember what I wrote too much about uh, Quan Chi's backstory. I think the idea, when we came up with him, I remember thinking that Shang Tsung was gone. And he was, for us, he was like a key villain, like he, he played that villain role. And I wanted um, someone to kind of fill his shoes, and that's kind of where the, the birth of Quan Chi was. Um, I don't know that I detailed, when, when I um, wrote the, uh, uh, Quan Chi's backstory, I don't know that I detailed it, you know, to that extent. I think that the idea was that he was just a rival sorcerer mm -hmm. to Shang Tsung, yep. and um, was able to kind of, he was a one guy who could, he could freely cross between realms. That was his secret yeah, power. Yeah, he was like a free roaming Exactly sorcerer. right, and that was his superpower, and so he could go into the nether, I mean, come, he'd come to Earth, he could go to Outworld. And, um, but other than that, I don't remember too much about his, I'm sorry, it's been so That's long. A, yeah. I don't remember too much about his, his detailed backstory. Okay. Um, Who's is this? Sub-Zero, in his ending, uh, it says, <laughs> yeah. he was hired, he was paid a large sum of money by one of Sung's wealthy enemies. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just put this up on camera. But who was, who was this enemy? If you have to fill in the blanks now, who paid Sub-Zero off? Wait, let me think about that. Yeah. Who, who had enough money to hire him to take out Shang Tsung? I don't, you know, I don't remember. I don't even remember the details. One thing I will say about the, the, the one thing to keep in mind with all the character endings yeah. in the first few games is they were always written as um, not so much um, canon. They were written almost as like outrageous, like these are like outrageous what if scenarios. Like what if, if they this, win? Yeah, yeah, what if this guy won? Maybe this would happen. Not so much canon. So I don't know what you know exactly what I was thinking back then. I'm remembering uh, in mythologies though. So he was like hired by Shang Tsung. He was hired by Shang Tsung. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's almost like Shang Tsung hired him to show to Mortal Kombat uh -huh. and then someone else kind of hired yeah, double him to take him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quan yeah. Chi exactly. hired me too. Could, Quan Chi hired yeah. you to steal the amulet. Yeah, the amulet. That right, was that right. whole business. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But then at the end of But is it possible that Quan Chi came, was also the wealthy Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. See, I wouldn't describe him as wealthy. That's not like something that comes yeah. to mind, though. But maybe. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so Johnny Cage, uh, we just lost Daniel. But Johnny Cage starred in a couple movies, like uh, Sudden Violence and Dragon Fist. Oh, yeah. All right. And now, if your job was to suddenly tell the Mortal Kombat audience what was the plot of those movies and what were they <laughs> rated, right? go. Well, they would all be rated R. <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. They'd be ultra violent. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I never, never put any thought in that. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, how about this one? So you know what they would look like though? They would look like really schlocky '80s uh, martial arts movies. <laughs> well, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So not not very sophisticated. No, no. All right. So I've got here um, a panel from the Mortal Kombat 2 comic. Okay. All right. Understand? I used to read this thing like all the time. Okay. These are the best. Um, they're bulletproof here. It says, uh, Lieutenant Steve Barron opens fire on the Outworld Warriors. His bullets have no effect. And, you know, they're all... Uh... That's because Shang Tsung is shielding them with magic. Oh, is that why? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was wondering about that because in later Mortal Kombat games, bullets do hurt yeah. them. You know, well, starting... Shang Tsung wasn't there to protect them. Okay. That's good. Good to know. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I guess I have one last question. This one's about Jax's arms. Um, and the, you know, in Mortal Kombat 3, he gives his arms an upgrade and they're metal. And uh, in this comic by Malibu, which predates Mortal Kombat 3, there's other special forces members that have got metal arms. Mm -hmm. So, so what's the deal? Did uh, did you get inspired by what the Malibu comics were doing, or did you consult I, with them and, and tell them, hey, I'm going to give Jack's metal arms. Maybe you want to foreshadow. No, no, no. Them. I actually, that's it's funny. I don't remember that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, maybe just coincidence. I I don't remember thinking of that comic when we did MK3. So I don't know what. Uh, yeah, I don't know where. It, it was always kind of neat to me because it's like in the Malibu comics, there's others. Sonya has other partners with metal arms. Right. And all of a sudden, Mortal Kombat 3, Jax, Jax has them. Yeah. It, we, I was thinking there's got to be some sort of a collaboration going on here. No. It's coincidence. Coincidence. Coincidence with a K. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's about all the questions I have. Cool. Hey, great team. So all right. Hey, great team. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, much for yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are we, so we're, like, we're on like, live right now? Like, people are watching yeah. us? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, here's a question 36VWI. And uh, you have to tell us what that stands for before anybody answers this. <laughs> What's about toasting? What's the story with that? Oh, that was um, Dan Forden, you know, the um, sound designer. Um, when we used to play the game, he would yell, your toast. And he would get in your face, you know, your toast, your toast. And then somehow that morphed into him yelling, toasty. He would like yell, toasty, toasty, you know, like in everybody's faces. And uh, that's, that's kind of where that was born. And so, yeah, having him kind of pop out was mm -hmm. was an homage to that. Came out the bottom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 that's how it started. But he was pretty annoying <laughs> getting in your face. <laughs> it's a good idea, though. You put your little twing on everything. Yeah. It's an image upside down, 36VWI. Oh, I can't visualize it. I'll have to look at it later. Yeah, all right, here, let me get up to it. I'll get you here. Okay, you take yeah. it off? And then, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Sal's number before I go. Maybe the okay. three of us will get together. Yeah, yeah. Are you here tonight or tomorrow? Or you take off? I'm leaving tomorrow. So are you? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we should yeah, get together, and uh, Sal's like right around the corner. Yeah, so. he's right in car. We're like letting everybody know this. <laughs> 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 All right, yeah. Good okay, to see cool. You. Take it easy. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming on here as well, John. Cool. It was nice to finally meet you, man. Yeah, it was great. Great being out. I think I speak for everybody when I say you made everyone's childhood awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's good. Thank you so it's much. It's great seeing so many fans and uh, being so many years after the original product. It's just amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's still awesome to see the footprint that you got, your vision, your baby, mm -hmm. still making an impact, man. It's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. But before you go, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days? I know you're at Zynga. Right. Um, I think as an art director. Is That's that right. right. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of the projects that you've worked on that you're able to talk about? Nothing near as exciting as any of this. Yeah. <laughs> I work on. Um, I work with a team of fantastic people, um, and I've got an uh, art staff of there's about seven of us, uh, and we um, we're working on a lot of like puzzle matching products. There's a game. That, that we did out now, it's a Wizard of Oz, Magic Match is the name of it. So everybody with a mobile device downloaded from the App Store. It's a lot of fun to play, doing really well. A lot of fun to work on that stuff. It's it's a different um, it's a different um, experience, obviously. It's different than you know the, the Mortal Kombat games are a whole different um, you know animal compared to that that stuff. So. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, the mobile games have a very different format from uh, arcade games. Yeah, I mean, any anybody who is able to kind of make a living doing anything that's creative is very fortunate. So. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, do you think you would ever work on a fighting game in the future? No, someone asked that earlier. Never say never. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. I think about it a lot. I mean, I still love fighting games, love telling story, and uh, maybe. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. I, I do have one more question for you, though, and this is this might be a pretty good one because you're into art and a little bit of software, maybe. Um, so virtual reality, do you think that could have a future with a fighting game like Mortal Kombat? I don't know, because so much of, of the fighting game experience is about the third person. You know, it's like you're controlling a character as opposed to you being the character. So I don't know. It's tough. Like if when I think of a VR experience, I think of you. Being, you know, the character that you're, that, that, or you being the character, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the strength of VR. And I don't know that fighting games lend themselves to that. Maybe someday someone will come along and create a way for that to make sense. But um, I don't know. In my, 
in my view right now, I think I think a, a lot of the fun of fighting games is controlling you know, another character. Yeah. Right on. Cool. Well, again, man, thanks so much right. for your time. Thank you again. Appreciate you having me. All right, and, uh, cool. Thanks a lot. We look forward to hopefully seeing you tomorrow as well. So cool. let's get rested up and right. enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, right, everybody. <laughs>